So uh, as I mentioned, this idea and this concept of self-care has been really what we've been doing and talking about when it, in regards to burnout. And self-care, what it does is it increases capacity, but it doesn't fundamentally change what we're exposed to and the systems in which we're part of. So while it expands capacity for a certain amount of time, it is not a solution. It's a, not a long-term approach and certainly can't really get us out of this burnout. Burnout has been an epidemic well before the pandemic, and the pandemic has negatively impacted a lot of the factors that impact burnout. And then as we reimagine work and we either go back into a virtual a hybrid or back to office, this is going to be another element on top of everything else that we need to address now. There's the levels of burnout are going to be things that we've never seen before. And as you see through this presentation, there's real um, impact on, on somebody's psychology, somebody's um, mind and body and their physical health, but certainly as an organization. So uh, burnout is defined as the exhaustion, inefficiencies and cynicism that come towards a topic or situation. In this presentation, what we're gonna be talking about is occupational burnout. So when it comes to exhaustion, cynicism and inefficiencies towards work. As you can imagine, what most of us require for work is this high level executive functioning. So creativity, innovation, productivity, and none of these things, the cynicism and exhaustion and inefficiency are good for these the functioning we need for work. And then let alone what the, the effect there is on our personal lives. With burnout, usually what you will see is at the end of a workday, somebody is so exhausted that they're not able to accomplish anything that they desire to do in life, which is going to then affect their burnout. So it becomes a really negative cycle. When we think of exhaustion, inefficiencies, and cynicism, they are contagious. Burnout is contagious. So we've seen in, in the literature, people uh, in teams of somebody that's burnt out being two to three times more likely to burn out themselves if they're in a team of somebody that is burnt out. So it is in our best interest to deal with burnout and to not have that cascading effect in the organization or within the team. Most people that are burnt out or are don't typically know they're burning out until they're already burnt out. It's one of those things that there's that even if there is red flags, you're not always able to see them in yourself. However, if you know what they are, you can start seeing them in other people and helping people make the changes required to make a difference. There's stress, there's burnout, and there's depression, and they really overlap in symptoms. So how do you tell the difference? It's not clear cut, but the easiest way is if you remove the thing that's burning you out. So if you get away from work, are you able to see respite and uh, improvements in the sensations of burnout? If that's the case, it's more than likely burnout. Because there's such a cascading, overwhelming overlap of symptoms, if you are experiencing burnout and you went to a medical physician, they would often prescribe you antidepressants or diagnose you with depression. But we know that antidepressants do not work for burnout, so it becomes a really difficult phenomenon. We're still at that cusp of understanding what burnout is and what we can do about it. Um, so it's something that I hope we'll see a really great evolution in the next several years. There is a, an immediate and direct effect of burnout on your body, on your physical health. As you can see and read through the, these items, none of it is good and really serves you in any way. And of course, this is any kind of mental illness, you will see a physical uh, impact of that. There is also an impact on your brain. What I find particularly interesting is that cynicism that happens ends up being a negative feedback loop that you are not able to draw on as easily as readily those positive emotions. So it chemically, physically changes your brain to be cynical. And so it becomes particularly difficult to draw yourself out of. So if you have been burnt out or you know somebody that's been burnt out, it's an incredibly difficult thing to rectify or to improve with self-care because the neurons are created that you are having this level of cynicism. 
We often talk about workload as if it's the major contributor to burnout, but it's actually just one of the six contributing factors to burnout. So workload, if it's an impossible workload, of course, it will impact burnout. But then there's control or autonomy over work. Do you, do you have control over what you do, work you do or when or how you do your work? That is going to help relieve some of the symptoms of burnout. Reward systems that are in place. If you're a leader, if you're even a team member, are you rewarding and making sure you reach out with some sort of social support when somebody does really great work? Reward systems can also be compensation. Are you compensating appropriately for the work that you do? Community is cornerstone to mental well-being and physical well-being. We know this, and of course, this is what we've had to be more conscious of in the last little while. What is your community and your system of support at work, specifically within the work context? And then what is it outside of work? And how can you invest in that? And how can you ensure it's there? And how can you ensure it's there for other people? A level of fairness. If we feel like something is unjust or unfair, we're going to see the impact of that. Now, some things we can do work with others to increase the fairness of, and some things we can't. I'll give you an example. At the beginning of the pandemic, when a lot of parents were all of a sudden overnight had children home that they were required to homeschool or care give, a lot of the work and teams got shifted to the non-parents. That's not fair. However, it's what most teams needed to do to get through this period of time. So can a conversation happen around that? Can you acknowledge that it is unfair uh, as a leader or as a supporter in realizing it's for a short term and it's for the team to get through? Even that acknowledgement and that conversation can go so far in helping relieve some of the contribute, that contributing factor. And then value systems. How much of your day reflects the values in which you have? I had a great opportunity uh, in our recent podcast season, The Science of Work, to talk to world experts on work-life balance or work-life integration, which is what I prefer. Often we don't finish a day and we're like, well, that was perfectly balanced. So if we're seeking work-life balance, we're kind of setting ourselves up to fail. But if we think of work-life integration and time, va time value um, and how we're using those two factors. So if we're somebody that really values uh, team-based work, and a lot of our work is independent, we will see the negative effects of that. So are there conversations you can have within the work context of that? Or if you're somebody that really values family time, friend time, and that's not what you're getting with the current work structure, can you talk to your leader or um, to your team about changing some of that work structure? We know that the nine to five in a cubicle at a desk is not how humans function at our best. So can we adapt work? Can we take this time that we're reimagining what work looks like to figure out what works best for us and for our teams? Burnout is a two-way conversation. The person that is burning out, that is feeling that, needs to be able to communicate it. We, we, team leader, cannot solve that or help you solve it if we do not know what's happening. If you keep saying yes to work, if you keep completing it at a certain level, we don't know. And for leaders and teams, we need to be able to accept that conversation, understand, not blame, not shame, and reimagine what work looks like so that that person has capacity to do really great work. The conversations we're going to have after this presentation are really going to be centered around how can we help each other. But a cornerstone to that is it needs to be a two-way communication. And with that, it needs to have the psychological safety within the teams, within the companies to be able to do that. There's multiple different types of burnout. There's parental, caregiver, occupational, athletic. These are the ones that are most pronounced in the literature. And as you can imagine, over the past year, the first two have sunken into the third and vice versa. So there's not this, like often when it's studied, it's like occupational or it's caregiver. And now there's very much not a clear line between any of these. So while we're talking about occupational burnout, it is so fair to acknowledge that there's not this great separation we have between our two worlds of work and non-work. So we have to address any of the key factors that are affecting us from these different areas. 
There's also personality types that are more at risk of burnout. You might be able to associate with some of these or people on your teams or people you know. The highly motivated, the perfectionist, the type A people who are goal-oriented and a little bit anxious on the side that have low social support. So think of the people that have just joined a team or moved to a new area. This can make somebody at a particular risk of burnout. Have low autonomy over their jobs. A lot of the literature actually is around call center work because they have very little autonomy over their work and when, when and how they do their job. Um, the people pleasers and the workaholics. I think I probably can resonate with the majority of these. So you know that there is um, a little bit more at risk in certain professions and certain personality types.